with me here on VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, John Russell and I tell you how and why young people in China are changing their spending behaviors. Later, Dan Novak will present this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, before the COVID-19 pandemic, Doris Fu imagined a different future for herself and her family. She imagined buying a new car and a bigger apartment, eating at nice restaurants on weekends, and traveling to tropical islands. But today, the 39-year-old Shanghai marketing professional is saving her money as much as she can. Fu and many other Chinese in their 20s and 30s are worried about China's pandemic lockdowns, the high unemployment rates among young people, and a weakening property market. As a result, young Chinese citizens are focused on saving instead of spending. This frugal way of life has been made more popular by social media. Influencers across social media are sharing their money-saving tips and tricks. This rise of low-cost living, however, may harm the world's second-largest economy. Consumer spending makes up more than half of China's gross domestic product, or GDP. Benjamin Cavender is a director of China Market Research Group. He said, We've been mapping consumer behavior here for 16 years, and in all of that time, this is the most concerned that I've seen young consumers. Unemployment among young people aged 16 to 24 stands at almost 19 percent, says government data. Some young people have been forced to take pay cuts. The average salary in 38 major Chinese cities fell 1% in the first three months of this year. That information comes from the online job search company Jilian Jiaopin. As a result, some young people prefer to save money instead of spending it. Fu, for example is a huge movie fan. She said she used to go to the movie theater to see a film two times a month. But, Fu said, I haven't stepped inside a cinema since the pandemic. Almost 60% of people in China are now likely to save more rather than spend or invest more, according to the most recent study by the People's Bank of China or PBOC. That number was 45% three years ago. That is a problem for China's economic policymakers, who have long depended on consumer spending to increase economic growth. A PBOC official said in July that when the pandemic eases, the willingness to invest and consume will stabilize, and rise. The PBOC did not answer Reuters reporters' requests for comment. China's Ministry of Commerce also did not answer requests for comment. After years of rising spending fueled by rising wages, online shopping, and easy credit, young people are changing their spending behaviors. The changes bring them closer to the ways of their parents' generation, whose memories of hard economic times have made them more likely to save money. But unlike their parents, 
young Chinese are making a show of their frugal way of life online. One woman in her twenties in the eastern city of Hangzhou has gained hundreds of thousands of followers by publishing videos on how to make dinner for ten yuan, about one dollar forty-five cents. The woman goes by the name La Jiang on social media. People on social media are discussing money-saving tips and even creating competitions. The Live Off 1,600 Yuan a Month Challenge took off among young people in Shanghai, one of China's costliest cities. Yang Jun says she was deep in credit card debt before the pandemic. In 2019, she started a group called. The Low Consumption Research Institute, on the networking site Douban, the group has gained more than one hundred fifty thousand members. Yang said she is cutting spending and is selling some of her belongings on second-hand websites to make money. Yang also said she has cut out her daily Starbucks coffee. Fu, the marketing professional. Said she changed her makeup brand from Givenchy to a Chinese brand called Florasis, which is about sixty percent less costly. Yang and Fu are not the only ones in China giving up such goods. Both Starbucks and the French dealer that owns Givenchy have reported sharp drops in sales in China in the most recent quarter. Fu said she has delayed her plans to sell her two small apartments for a bigger one that is near a better school system for her son. She also has given up on her goal of buying a newer, nicer car. Why do I dare not upgrade my house and my car, even if I have the money? Fu said, "Everything is unknown." <laughs> Thanks to John Russell for his help on that report. Next is this week's education report. Listen closely; there might be a quiz question for you to answer after we hear Dan's story. More school systems around the country. Are using online classes when communities face disasters like wildfires, storms, or water shortages. In Jackson, Mississippi, a problem with the public water system left the city without safe water for several days. As a result, schools went online for one week. The time in remote learning did not last long for the twenty thousand student school system in Jackson. Enough water pressure was returned earlier this month for children to go back to in-person learning, and last week, the city said water was safe for normal use. However, online learning increased the disruption for children and teachers. At home. Children attending online classes often had their whole family in the house. Early in 2020, school officials had high hopes for remote learning. Since then, the problems with it have become clearer. The change to online learning caused many students to fall behind where they should be in their studies. And it added to new worries about students' mental health. At the same time, the push for online learning led to increased use of technology, which made remote learning possible on a large scale. In 2018, two powerful storms hit the same areas in North Carolina, causing schools in some places to close. Some students were out of school for weeks. There were attempts at remote learning, but many children did not have laptop computers or other technology. As a result, most schools tried to move students to other in-person buildings, 
said Gary Henry. He is head of the University of Delaware's College of Education and Human Development and has been part of a research team studying the effects of remote learning. Henry said school systems now will look first to online learning. For a period of a few weeks, he said it could be a way to keep students on track. But the pandemic showed that it is not effective over a long period of time. Schools in Mora, New Mexico, for example, switched to remote learning last April when the town was evacuated because of a wildfire. It was a difficult start, Superintendent Marvin McCauley said. Some of the displaced students and teachers were in evacuation centers and did not have computer technology. As time went on, people were able to get computers or get on the Internet. In mid-August, students went back to school in person for the first time since the fire. When there's a lot of stuff that has happened, it's better to have the kids in person so you can see how they are, take note of their behaviors, and provide the support to them, Macaulay said. In Creskill, New Jersey, after a strong ocean storm hit in 2021, the building containing the high school and middle school was flooded. The school system had no choice but to start the school year online. School superintendent Michael Burke said that learning online is rough for kids' mental health issues. It's rough for kids for socialization. And it's hard for parents who have to arrange for someone to be home. After a period of time, Cresco offered both online and in-person teaching. The school system worked with a local religious group to use its 14 classrooms. Later, in February, the school moved into a neighboring town's church building so students could go to class every day. Sarah Bars has a daughter going to school in Cresco. It's not school, she said, of remote learning. It's a last resort, and it shouldn't be a crutch that we rely on for school. In Jackson, Mississippi, fifth grade teacher Ryan Johnson used his experience from the pandemic to help new teachers at his school. They faced the same problems when the school system moved online during the city's water crisis. Teachers worked hard last year to help students improve, he said but he said he worries about the possible effects of another long school closure. I'm Dan Novak. Thanks, Dan. Now, here is a question for you all to test your understanding of what you just heard. Why are school systems more likely to turn to remote learning after the pandemic? Is it... A. There is now more federal and state funding for remote learning. B. More Americans got access to the Internet during the pandemic. Or C. The push for online learning made remote learning more possible on a large scale. The answer is... C. You can answer more questions about Dan's story on our website learningenglish.voanews.com has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. 
For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. From VOA Learning English, this is The Making of a Nation, American History in Special English. I'm Steve Ember. The United States became a nation in 1776. Less than a century later, in the 1860s, it was nearly torn apart. A civil war took place, the only one in the nation's history. States from the North and the South fought against each other. The conflict involved the right of the South to leave the Union and deal with issues, especially the issue of slavery, in its own way. We examine how the Constitution survived this very troubled time in American history. The Civil War was fought from 1861 to 1865. 600,000 men were killed or wounded. In the end, the slaves were freed and the Union was saved. Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War. He said the southern states did not have the right to leave the Union. Lincoln firmly believed that the Union was permanent under the Constitution. In fact, he noted that one of the reasons for establishing the Constitution was to form a more perfect Union. His main goal was to save what the Constitution had created. One cannot truly understand the United States without understanding its Constitution. The document describes America's system of government and guarantees the rights of its citizens. The power of the Constitution is greater than any president, court, or legislature. In the coming weeks, we will tell the story of the United States Constitution, including the drama of its birth in Philadelphia in 1787. Before we do, however, we want to look at how the document provides for change without changing the basic system of government. If you ask Americans about their constitution, probably the first thing they will talk about is the Bill of Rights. These are the first ten changes to the Constitution. These ten amendments have the most direct effect on people's lives. The Bill of Rights guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of the press. In fact, all of those and more, including the right to peaceful assembly, are contained just in the First Amendment. The second one states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Other amendments say that People in criminal cases cannot be forced to make statements against themselves and have a right to a speedy and public trial by a jury. The Bill of Rights also deals with the separation of powers between the federal government and the states. In the words of the Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, 
or to the people. In other words, powers belong to the states unless the Constitution gives them to the federal government or prevents the states from having them. The Bill of Rights was not part of the document signed at the convention in Philadelphia in 1787. The delegates believed that political freedoms were basic human rights. Some of the delegates thought it was unnecessary to express these rights in a constitution. Most Americans, however, wanted their rights guaranteed in writing. This is why most states approved the new constitution only on the condition that a Bill of Rights would be added. This was done, and the amendments became law in 1791. One early amendment involved the method of choosing a president and vice president. In America's first presidential elections, whoever received the most votes became president. The candidate who received the second highest number of votes became vice president. The Constitution was changed after separate political parties developed. Then, ballots began to list the names of separate candidates for president and vice president. There were no other amendments for 60 years. The next one was born in the blood of the Civil War. During the war, President Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation. That document freed the slaves in the states that were rebelling against the Union. Later, the 13th Amendment banned slavery everywhere in the country. But Lincoln never lived to see it. He was shot a week after the South surrendered. The 14th Amendment, approved in 1868, said no state could limit the rights of any citizen. And the 15th, approved two years later, said a person's right to vote could not be denied because of his race, color, or former condition of slavery. By the 1890s, the federal government needed more money than it was receiving from taxes on imports. It wanted to establish a tax on earnings. It took 20 years to win approval for the 16th Amendment. The amendment permits the government to collect income taxes. Another amendment proposed in the early 1900s was designed to change the method of electing United States senators. For more than 100 years, senators were elected by the legislatures of their states. The 17th Amendment, approved in 1913, gave the people the right to elect senators directly. In 1919, the states approved an amendment to ban the production, transportation, and sale of alcohol. Alcohol was prohibited. It could not be produced or sold legally anywhere in the United States. The amendment, however, did not stop the flow of alcohol. Criminal organizations found many ways to produce and sell it illegally. Finally, after 13 years, Americans decided that prohibition had failed. It caused more problems than it solved. So in 1933, the states approved another constitutional amendment to end the ban on alcohol. Other amendments in the 20th century include one that gives women the right to vote. It became part of the Constitution in 1920. 
Another amendment limits a president to two four-year terms in office. And the 26th Amendment gives the right to vote to all persons who are at least 18 years old. The 27th Amendment has one of the strangest stories of any amendment to the United States Constitution. This amendment establishes a rule for increasing the pay of senators and representatives. It says there must be an election between the time Congress votes to increase its pay and the time the pay raise goes into effect. The amendment was first proposed in 1789. Like all amendments, it needed to be approved by three-fourths of the states. This did not happen until 1992. So one of the first amendments to be proposed was the last amendment to become law. The 27 amendments added to the Constitution have not changed the basic system of government in the United States. The government still has three separate and equal parts, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. The three parts balance each other. No part is greater than another. The first American states had no strong central government when they fought their War of Independence from Britain in 1776. They cooperated under an agreement called the Articles of Confederation. The agreement provided for a Congress, but the Congress had few powers. Each state governed itself. When the war ended, the states owed millions of dollars to their soldiers. They also owed money to European nations that had supported the Americans against Britain. The new United States had no national money to pay the debts. There was an American dollar, but not everyone used it. And it did not have the same value everywhere. The situation led to economic ruin for many people. They could not pay the money they owed. They lost their property. They were put in prison. Militant groups took action to help them. They interfered with tax collectors. They terrorized judges and burned court buildings. The situation was especially bad in the northeast part of the country. In Massachusetts, a group led by a former soldier tried to seize guns and ammunition from the state military force. Shays Rebellion, as it was called, was stopped. But from the north to the south, Americans were increasingly worried and frightened. Would the violence continue? Would the situation get worse? Many Americans distrusted the idea of a strong central government. After all, they had just fought a war to end British rule. Yet Americans of different ages, education, and social groups felt that something had to be done. If not, the new nation would fail before it had a chance to succeed. These were the opinions and feelings that led, in time, to the writing of the United States Constitution. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 